So, Chris, thank you for some, taking some time out this morning to join us and uh, talk about these COIL questions. COIL is the Center for Online Innovation and Learning. And um, we've been posing three questions to our guests about uh, the future of education, um, some of the barriers to realizing that future, and finally, the um, personal leadership skill sets that we'll need to realize uh, a new place in education. And, okay. and with your position and in your view, Mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're really sitting at a very interesting uh, advantage point of ob observing and as well as helping to guide. Um, so our first question has to do about where do you see, um, we'll just say education broadly, not just higher education, but education as a field going in a relatively short period of time, three to five years, isn't, mm -hmm. isn't way out there, it's right. almost here. Uh, any thoughts about that? And then I'd be curious to know from your vantage point, where do you see your institution going and aligning with that? Okay. Well, I think that technology, uh, obviously, is going to play an increasing role in uh, different instructional models that uh, we can really embrace. And so we're looking at those next generation learning models of uh, adaptive learning, learning, competency-based learning. Um, and then all of the data that is provided by uh, technology uh, to be able to measure performance and uh, mm -hmm to see where you really need to shore up any gaps uh, within when you're trying to reach goals like retention and completion with analytics tools. and mm -hmm. So it's tools and it's also instructional kinds of um, uh, assets to help you to improve um, you know, that instructional model. And I think that's going to happen across mm -hmm. the board. K-12 mm -hmm. is going to perfect more the blended model. I think that that's what they're really embracing. And then I think uh, relative to, to higher education, it's going to be more about you know, how you prefer to perfect that asynchronous model to reach more people, but also those blended and hybrid models that really make sense for us. So I think that's, uh, and then there's going to be increasing pressure on us from policymakers uh, to be more efficient uh, with our dollars, right, and to ensure that, you know, we're not thinking just brick and mortar uh, mentality, that we have to build more, that we have to use the technology uh, along with the brick and mortar that we currently have so that we're more efficient with our dollars and that at the same time we still have access at the top of our agenda and completion now as well, mm -hmm. to, especially for community colleges. Mm -hmm. And so you asked about my institution and how it's aligning those goals. So we're, we're beginning to see how we can embrace competency-based education and degree programs that make sense for us, not for the whole college, but certainly mm -hmm. uh, along that line there. We're doing work in predictive analytics. Uh, we're working with Civitas. Mm -hmm. uh, learning now relative to that and we have our own Rio PACE program and we found some promise and in increasing retention and persistence mm -hmm. rates and then uh, giving us some um, strategies as well alerts to be able to um, really uh, target that intervention yeah. strategies exactly so that we can we've got big metrics that we have mm -hmm. to meet on completion Lumina has given us the 2025 right. goal of 60% right. uh, uh, degree attainment in in the country and sure. then even in our own state. And in our own state in Arizona, we're at 25%, so we have a long way to go. Wow. We're really working hard to do that. So I think those metrics and those mm. goals are going to drive us, um, you know, in terms of what those policy constructs look like and, and mandates. But also, the, the main thing is to improve student learning outcomes, you know, in completion. And it all yeah. really gets back to that. I, you know, I, yeah, I love that point. You're, you're really, everything you've said talks about serving the learner. The use of the metrics, the early intervention systems, um, and that's where you see the the field of education focusing, which is really exciting. Mm -hmm. it, it's kind of embarrassing to say maybe we haven't been there as much as we needed to be. Right. So in that idea, I love the idea that this really a student empowered space. Um, what do you think of uh, that might be the barriers to us kind of realizing that that new kind of a, a learning space? Well, in, uh, especially in higher education, we're more used to looking at the institutional needs, sometimes before the student needs, right? Mm -hmm. the, and, and we aren't as student focused, as you said. Sometimes it's obvious that you should, everything uh, lends itself to being student focused. But sometimes we think more about our own schedules and, you know, what these initiatives that are coming forth um, uh, that are uh, helping us to do better in higher education, how it impacts us as individuals right. or our own in institutions, institutions rather than moving everything, moving all of the furniture within the organization to meet those student needs. Um, and so it's getting our house in order for that. And then listening to the voice of 
of the student, meaning what they need, and then uh, creating um, a program that meets those needs. And I think community colleges have done that well over the years Good relative point. to being sure. on the ground and very adept at doing that. Sure. Um, there are more financial kinds of um, pressures now that don't allow us to, do, to be all things to all people mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's going to have to be a lot more prioritization in, in all of that as well. So the barriers, some of them are policy barriers. Mm -hmm. If you want to do more competency-based education, and maybe there's, uh, the, the funding is based on seat time, then you know, the USDOE is looking at already some uh, experimental sites for that kind of thing. So as in my institution, we would have to ask ourselves, do we want to be part of that first group that does that as a new frontier college experimenting on on uh, on that front and so we've always been a college that has been willing to try things that are new and uh, best for students so so at the policy level because i know that's a lot where you live mm -hmm. um are you hearing as well the interest and energy around that learner in other words the policy is shifting away from the needs of I don't know, the government or the institutions in, in f almost forcing education to realign and to refocus a bit on, on who that learner is. Yeah, totally. And I think yeah. that it's about um, you know, building access for students, but mm -hmm. affordability. We've seen President Obama talk about the increased tuition rates that mm -hmm. have been uh, plaguing really our students uh, in terms of their access to higher ed and also costing the government more money because sure. they're providing the financial aid at higher rates, tuition rates that they're paying for. So uh, that, and then they're concerned about the wage level of students uh, r relative to the debt that they're incurring is, is the job they're gonna get once they get out, gonna pay right. for that debt. Right. And if it's not, then that's a public concern. Mm. Um, and so it's mm. really all about uh, the student relative to you know, what they're getting for their money right. and then what the government's getting for its right. money. And right. we're gonna see more and more of those pressures that I talked about before as policy issues. Mm. What are we really getting yeah. for it? And um, can institutions mm -hmm. be more nimble? Can they be more adaptable to do mm -hmm. things differently rather than the same old way? Um, in, in order to get much more for the student and then hence mm -hmm. the business community and the community in general, because sure. we hear business leaders saying as well right. that they're not getting what they want out of the higher ed system and for students. So I think mm -hmm. we're going to see more and more of those pressures and, and how well we adapt to that and how entrepreneurial we are in uh, meeting those kinds of mandates or challenges, sure, and then turning those into opportunities, uh, I think, for ourselves. Is so really my, my, my last one then, with that as a foundation, as a groundwork, if you have a new or emerging leader coming into our field today, um, what skill sets, competencies, what do they need to be thinking about in order to be successful in this new space? Well, I think um, culture matters a lot mm -hmm. and building a culture that really embraces change and innovation, and I think uh, leaders need to understand how to, to lead change, organizational change, uh, because we're gonna be experiencing change even more often and more uh, mm. sporadically than ever before. And so I think we need to really think about you know, how we do that successfully, mm -hmm. because the more that you have, a, a you're only as good as your team, and if your team is embracing uh, adaptability and and uh, innovation and are willing to change with the times, then you're way ahead of the curve, right? Mm -hmm. But if you have a culture that, you know, they've got their feet on the ground entrenched. and they're entrenched yeah. and they're unwilling to move, mm -hmm. and it's more among the traditional minds of this is the way we've always done it, yeah. then that takes a lot more to move that mountain, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. you know, I think leaders need to decide too um, what institutions they want to lead or whether mm -hmm. when they're in an institution, mm -hmm. how they choose um, you know, their, their careers and professions. Is it with an institution that aligns more to what they want to do? Mm -hmm. Or is it uh, trying to do that yeoman's work of moving maybe a very traditional organization into being more progressive, which is much harder work. Mm -hmm. So I think they need to think about that. And then I think um, they're going to need to be better advocates too. Uh, mm -hmm. Advocacy is going to play a big part of it too in terms of uh, barriers that exist sure. that you need to move to continue to move forward with agendas and I think that's in long the challenge. lines of advocacy you have to be aware then of mm -hmm. of the policy stuff and you have to be aware of the institutional and the culture so there, there's a lot of a lot of things going on there for for a leader to get a hold of there is and I think they need to expose themselves more to mm -hmm. that and be uh, more engaged so mm -hmm. if they have opportunities to be a part of policy committees or um, visit 
the legislature sure. um, with their uh, government relations professionals or to learn more from their government relations professionals how they can be helpful mm -hmm. to the cause of uh, what's important to uh, the system and the institution. There are a lot of politics involved yeah. in all of that. Yeah. But if you're going to engage in leadership, um, I always tell folks where two or more people are gathered, there's, there's going to be some kind of politics, whether it's a right. husband or a wife right. or a brother and a sister I or agree. two friends yeah. where decisions have to be made and people have to be willing to compromise. Mm. But compromise in such a way that it's a win-win mm. um, relationship and that you get what you want, they get what they want, a bit of it, and nobody gets everything they want, and you can continue to move Look forward. forward. Okay. That's the challenge. Well, thank you so much for taking your time. It's always a pleasure yeah. to work with you. Pleasure to work with thank you, you too. Chris. Thank you. Okay.